It may be months before a building in downtown Maryville reopens this after the brick facade fell off onto the sidewalk below. The bricks first started falling Sunday and you can see what that building looked like before on Sunday and what it looks like now. Quite a comparison. 10 News reporter Gabrielle Hayes has been on this story throughout the day. She joins us live from near that building collapse, at least the facade collapse. Gabrielle, what can you tell us right now? Well, Robin and John, contractors spent several hours removing debris this morning. I'm going to move to the side a little bit so you can kind of see what it looks like now. They spent several hours trying to get this tarp up, but also these barricades so no more brick, bricks would fall and no one else could get inside. The first brick fell over the weekend. Building owner Walker Johnson says he immediately got a contractor on the phone. The first call we got was on Sunday and we had a whole section of brick fall. That's where Daryl Wilson comes in. He's a project manager at a local commercial restoration company. Well, we got the call on Monday that uh, this had happened over the weekend. He says after the facade collapsed Sunday, his team, the owner and a structural engineer came out to assess the damage. All seemed under control, but early Thursday morning, more bricks and parts of the building began to tumble and the team had to start from square one. A lot of people would think, you know, you'd want to get in here and get this going and get it done, but it's an actual slow process. Experts say this is typically how it works. Rob Hauser is a structural engineer at Bender and Associates. He says determining the cause can depend on several factors like moisture. Wind, heavy storms, even seismic activity. Um, if the mortar uh, is very, very old and it's made of certain materials. In terms of surrounding buildings, he says facades don't typically cause a problem, but most engineers will check for cracks and signs like that. You do want to look and see if there are signs of failure that are uh, near the adjacent buildings. And safety is something Johnson says is his number one priority. And it'll be a while before the team learns how exactly the bricks fell. Until then, he's just glad no one got hurt. It's just a shock, but like we tell everybody, we're so thankful nobody was near it. Now, it took crews uh, most of the morning into the afternoon to get this tarp up, but they say the repair pro process could take several months. And with that, we'll send it back to you all in the studio. Gabrielle Hayes on the story in Maryville. Thank you. Well, the state ordered a West Knoxville child care facility to close immediately after repeated violations. State records show Helping Hands Child Care on Office Park Circle served children six weeks to 12 years old. Records also show the child care center has a zero star quality rating. Most recently, DHS says a parent complained that two preschool children were in the parking lot unsupervised while the rest of the class was on the playground. 10 News reporter Stephanie Haynes joins us and Stephanie that's just one of many violations the state goes on to list. Yes, Robin and John state records say the child care center has been cited 31 times for violating child care licensing laws. The state put it on probation in February and the state says it's found more violations since then. But here are a few from years before in 2017 DHS found that a toddler was left alone outside after the class went back inside. In 2018, DHS found two infants were sleeping in swings in a classroom. An inspector once found that there were inappropriate adults to child ratios. And on a separate occasion, DHS found there was no procedure in place for keeping track of the kids as they moved from playground to classroom. DHS said in a statement, quote, the pattern of violations demonstrates a continuing inability to maintain compliance with licensing rules and an escalating level of risk for children in their care. Now, I went to the daycare center today and called and asked for a manager, but I was told no or they aren't here today. Robin and John. All right, Stephanie, thank you very much. In a few hours, the state of Tennessee is set to execute Donnie Johnson. Johnson was convicted of killing his wife back in 1984 in West Tennessee. He is currently under death watch. He chose no special final meal. 10 News spoke to Johnson on death row back in 1992. He explained to reporter Chuck Denny how his life had changed. This message will be blessed and their eyes will be open to see the truth and the light. Inmate number 109031 at Riverbend Security Prison, Don Johnson of Covington. He awaits the electric chair with his tape recorder and his Bible. Johnson records a gospel radio show in his cell on death row. He tells his listeners he is not afraid to die. Death is just a, a sleep. 
When I wait is when Christ returns and takes me home, takes me to heaven. Johnson was convicted in 1984 of brutally murdering his wife Connie. He stuffed a plastic bag down her throat and choked her, and later dumped the body at a Memphis shopping mall. We're all classified as one here, regardless of who did what. Today, Johnson fights for his own life and the lives of all death row inmates. One life, can you put a value on one life taken wrongly? No matter who takes it. And you compound that when the state takes it wrongly. Again, that was former 10 News reporter Chuck Denny. Johnson is set to die tonight by lethal injection. His legal appeals have failed, and Governor Bill Lee says he will not intervene. We are learning new details this evening about the Kentucky boy found safe after he was missing for almost three days. 22-month-old Kenneth Howard disappeared from his home Sunday evening. Rescuers say he was out in the elements for that entire time. Once they found him, the first concern was getting him some kind of water because a person can't survive for more than three days without water. He looked severely de dehydrated and they were rushing to get an IV line into him. Uh, and I think they took maybe one or two times to get it into him because he was so dehydrated. Uh, but once they got that line into him and started getting him hydrated, uh, he was starting to come around. Rescuers say other than needing some water, Kenneth was fine, and they are calling this a miracle. Two East Tennessee counties will receive federal aid after the February 23rd storms and flooding. Anderson and Loudoun counties are two of 59 counties included in the federal aid. It allows local government and community groups to apply for reimbursement of flood-related costs. It does not provide help to individual people. 16 other East Tennessee counties were previously granted federal aid for the same storms. And we're going to move to the forecast. No sign of storms right now. Gorgeous weather outside yet again, though. Robin, those temperatures are climbing. They are going to continue to climb. Todd Howe is out on Market Square where um, I can see it's quite sunny and obviously quite warm where you are, Todd. You know it is, but I tell you what, we'll take it. It's finally sunny and warmer after a couple of uh, cool days, certainly. The sun is out. We are live at Market Square. It's Concerts on the Square that continues this Thursday evening from 7 to 9 p.m. It's free. Bring your cheer. They'll be handing out free water. Katie Pruitt, one of the headliners performing tonight, she'll also be performing tomorrow night as part of Rhythm and Blooms. And we'll see you back down here tomorrow night as well for Friday. Yeah, we are live on Market Square again. That starts tonight at 7 p.m. And uh, folks starting to gather, getting off work. What a gorgeous Thursday afternoon and now early evening. You see the bright sunshine and temperatures are responding. Let's take a look at our live camera view from Market Square right above us. Almost could get out there in the sunshine and wave at everybody right there. We are looking at a lot of beautiful sunshine right now from Market Square. And as we take a view and uh, check on what's going on from our Sharp Shridge camera, we're also looking at beautiful sunshine today. And again, seeing very nice conditions across the region. Temperatures continue to respond and warm up. As uh, right now, we're looking at 80 degrees in Knoxville. Humidity 39% with a dew point temperature of 53 degrees. So finally making it back up to 80 degrees after three straight days in a row in the 60s. And it will be milder tonight. Gorgeous weather now. We'll talk about our rain chances as we head into the weekend and if it will continue to be summer-like for an extended period. I'll see you back with your full forecast in just a few moments for right now, live from Market Square where Concerts on the Square starts tonight at 7. I'll send it back to you, John and Robin. Lots going on, yeah. getting ready to launch mm -hmm. into a busy weekend. Todd, thank you. And we can expect several road closures in the old city this weekend for Rhythm and Blooms. Set up for the main stage did start today, and the parking lots under James White Parkway there, much of East Jackson Avenue, will close at 8 tomorrow morning and stay closed through Sunday night, and that is where you can find the festival's free street fair. Some breakdown of the activities going on. That is happening through Monday morning. A lot more on our website, WBIR.com. We're going to check the roads now with Ed Rupp, who has a look at the Thursday evening commute. Hey, Ed. Hey, guys. Good afternoon. A car fire on 40 eastbound down your Paper Mill Road got us off to a pretty bad start, thanks to Mark Nagy for that picture. So that's been cleared up and out of the way, but it got all the way backed up, back past Lovell Road, so it is still running slow, 40 eastbound into downtown. Fortunately, at the moment, no wrecks blocking anything. 40 west a little slow once you get west of Alcoa Highway, and it's been extra slow on 
Pellissippi, too, cutting over from Interstate 40 over to Alcoa Highway over in uh, the west side of town. As you get Alcoa Highway close to the airport, though, that looks pretty nice. And no wrecks blocking anything at the moment. We will keep you updated in the 10 News Traffic Center. Guys? Ed, thank you. Knoxville officially has six candidates for mayor. Noon today was the deadline to submit a qualifying petition to the Election Commission to run in this year's city elections. The six candidates are Michael Andrews, Fletcher Burkhart, India King Cannon, Eddie Manis, Calvin Taylor Skinner, and Marshall Stair. Mayor Madeline Rojero is term limited. The primary is August 27th and the general election is November 5th. After decades of stalemates on immigration, President Trump unveiled a new reform plan today. It would shift America's immigration policies to a merit-based system favoring hired skilled workers rather than family ties to the U.S. Democrats and even some Republicans are already expressing concerns. Jennifer Johnson explains. President Trump unveiling his latest immigration reform plan, shifting to a merit-based system, prioritizing high-skilled workers while giving fewer green cards to immigrants with family ties in the U.S. As a result of our broken rules, the annual green card flow is mostly low-wage and low-skilled. The current system awards about 66% of green cards to immigrants with family ties, 12% based on skills. The president's plan would reverse that, creating a points-based visa system similar to those used by other countries. Future immigrants will be required to learn English and to pass a civics exam prior to admission. The plan has little hope of passing in a divided Congress. Democrats say it fails to address millions of immigrants already here illegally and the so-called dreamers brought to the U.S. as children. Neither Donald Trump's grandfather nor my father would be able to come to America under this proposal. The president facing an uphill battle as he also deals with the growing military escalation with Iran. Mr. President, are we going to war with Iran? I hope not. Congress concerned and demanding to know what triggered the Pentagon to move U.S. bombers and warships to the region. But if you continue to apply maximum pressure and don't open a pressure valve, i.e. negotiations, then you have a pressure cooker that will explode. New intelligence about the Iranian threat is now being shared with eight top House and Senate leaders. Jennifer Johnson, NBC News, Washington. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi says the president must get authorization from Congress before taking any military action.